Riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense. All the songs are B-sides and the cover art's a mess. There's so much here to tear apart. Listen to it for a week, now that we pass past. Why I Hate This Album Podcast with Tim and Garrett. Hello and welcome to another episode of Why I Hate This Album. I am one of your hosts, Garrett Harvey. With me as always, Eeyore to my piglet, co-host extraordinaire, Timothy Richardson. Tim, how you doing? This week I am in a somber and reflective mood. I had a feeling you might be. Why don't you tell the folks why you were in such a somber and reflective attitude? Well, Garrett, that is because this week we have come together to discuss a national tragedy. Oh, wow. I didn't know we were going to get into this. Yeah. I mean, we have to. When this episode comes out, it will be the 17th anniversary of one of the darkest days in our country or really in the world's history. Tim, I don't know if the show is the right format to even be discussing this we're kind of a jokes based show i don't there will be so many jokes i really don't know that we should be making jokes about this particular day i mean we have to though it's it's so ridiculous i mean just of all the days though tim if you're gonna pick a day to make fun of i'm just i'm not sure i'm comfortable i'm gonna let you keep going but i just want to say right now i'm not saying no i'm just saying i'm a little uncomfortable All right. Well, this week we're discussing... Wait, Tim, I'm thinking about it. Maybe we shouldn't make any jokes about this. I'm thinking about how it might be taken, and we've built a nice audience. The folks that listen, they're so great, and they say such nice things. I don't know if you even need to bring up what you want to bring up. It's only going to lead to sadness and, most importantly, anger. Oh, it absolutely is, and it should, Garrett. This is an infuriating week. 17 Uh, years ago... Today, an album was released that was, Mm -hmm. I mean, it was truly, can we say it was the 9-11 of albums? Hmm. Well, I don't, I don't know because, well, why don't you tell the folks what album we're talking about? This week, we are talking about Nickelback's Silver Side Up, released September 11th, 2001, fittingly. For the record, I always thought that that's what we were going to talk about and what I was okay with making jokes about. Yes, and I think your idea to have a 9-11 themed week was really strange, but I hope it pays off. This was coincidence, folks. I will say, you did put a lot of effort into, a lot more effort than usual, into our annual 9-11 dinner. The turkey you made was just amazing. Hold on. 9-11 dinner? We have a Thanksgiving for 9-11. Well, we're not giving thanks for it, though. I think the way you express that is... (laughs) No, no, no. We have a Thanksgiving-style dinner to somberly remember... And uh, commemorate. And commemorate the events of 9-11. Nope, nope, no. Commemorate the lives of the heroes that we lost to this album right a lot of people died listening to this album what are we talking about we're talking about nickelback silver side up released 9 11 2001 this one's gonna get weird and probably offensive we apologize for that in advance let's get to the matter at hand let's ask it up top do you hate this album oh yes fuck this this (laughs) album sucks i don't know why we even had to ask that this week what about you oh yeah oh yeah absolutely No one will be getting anywhere this week, but we both got ourselves there individually and have come together to share, share our thereness, share the there, Tim. And I don't know what that means. No, I don't want to do that. When you're here, I get there. (laughs) Ugh. Well, I've already made t-shirts of everything I just said, so. (laughs) I mean, I'll wear those t-shirts. Tim, was this your first time to have your back nickeled? Before I hit play this week, I would have said I had no experience with this band. Until I listened to this garbage, and then I had a horrible realization, Garrett. Oh, yes. I never owned this album. I I remember not hating these songs. I knew every word to at least two of these songs. I mean, I must have heard them in full at least a thousand times driving into high school. And apparently I didn't hate it. It's not like I was carpooling with anyone. No one was forcing me to listen to that. I voluntarily listened to some of these songs. I think the phrase is to completion many times. 16 year old me was, I mean, that guy sucked way worse than I remember. Oh, yeah. Well, I think everybody's does. At least I hope so, because my 16 year old me is a constant source of fodder for me and thousands of people. So that's right. What about you? Is this the first time your 11's been nined? I know two songs total. 
I know the This Is How You Remind Me. Mm -hmm. I know that one end to end. Thank you, Radio. And I know not on this album, the song Hero for the Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. I know that song as well. I also, I'm pretty sure I know the song Photograph from a couple of albums later. Um, Although that that came out in 2005, so I don't have any reason why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was 20 then. Um, Oh my God, I knew you. Oh my God, you introduced me to Nickelback. Nope, that wasn't me. I can think of plenty of people we both knew that might have, though. But that doesn't in any way excuse the fact that you listened to it. So, you love the band. I have heard one song. I do not love the band. I hate the band. And I tolerated it on the radio by myself whenever I could easily have changed the station and listened to anything else. So you used to lock yourself in the bathroom and lip sync into a hairbrush to this album, and I I haven't heard it before. Yes. So you're going to be probably have a, a slightly different opinion about a lot of these songs than me. I absolutely hated it. But before we get into the album itself, we like to give everybody a little bit of background. So Tim, take us into the Wayback Machine and let us know how in the world did this back get so nickely? Nickelback was formed in 1995 by lead vocalist, guitarist, Dax Shepard-faced Avril Lavigne Marrier, Chadley Robert Turton, known by most people as Chad Kroger, and some other idiots that he was mostly related to in Alberta, Canada. Well, Um, I just want to say two things. mm -hmm. Most people called Alberta. More importantly, it is not Chad Kroger. Is it Krager? No. Oh, that's a great guess. Krager would be the appropriate way to say it, but no. He pronounces it Kruger. Okay. I hate this album more now. We have a relatively boring history leading into this album. Chadley grew up in what was mostly a boring middle-class life. The father left the family whenever he was two, and he started going by his mother's maiden name of Kruger. Early on, the brothers Chadley and Mike Kruger, and then their cousin Brandon Kruger, formed a band called the Village Idiots, which was mostly a Metallica cover band. I think they did some Led Zeppelin as well, along with guitarist Ryan Peake or Piquet, I don't know. In 1995, the four of them started Nickelback, which was really the same thing as the Village Idiots, but now they're writing original material. The name apparently came from his brother Mike's job at Starbucks. He would give people a Nickelback on their coffee. I hate it's, these guys, Garrett. I hate them so much. It's not a great reason to name your band Nickelback. No. Chadley got $4,000 from his stepfather to record their first demo, Hesher, which they released in 1996. According to Music Legend, half of this was used to record the EP and the other half was used to take a bunch of hallucinogens because they're really cool and edgy and that is totally a true story. I want to mention, this is a public service announcement, don't buy $2,000 worth of mushrooms. Yeah. That's too many. It is at least a thousand dollars too many for one person. It is like seventeen hundred dollars too many for two people. Okay. The appropriate amount of mushrooms for any one person, according to the Why I Hate This Album, the math that we have worked out is a hundred and fifty dollars worth of mushrooms per person at a time, no more, and also no less. Right. Anyway, Ryan Piquet funded the early band by borrowing another $30,000 from some Alberta bank. In 1996, they also released their first actual album, Curb, that was released exclusively in Canada and then internationally by Roadrunner Records, the company that gave us Slipknot a few years later. It was not well received by critics. Brandon Kruger leaves the band in 1997. He was their drummer. And they hire some guy, Mitch Gwinden. Yeah, the- these guys with the fucking name names, man. Yeah. That guy would leave the following year to work at a car company and then they hire Ryan Vicadel, who would also leave, but he would stay through at least this album. In 99, they signed with Roadrunner Records and they released The State in 2000. That does real poorly, too. They met up with producer Rick Parsher, well known for founding London Bridge Studio in Seattle. He helped cultivate the Seattle sound. He produced records for Temple of the Dog, Alice in Chains, Blind Melon, Dinosaur Jr., and Pearl Jam before he decided to slum it with these assholes. Oh, the slumming, though. I, I saw the dossier, but what Brad failed to put in there was the latter half of that career. Oh, yeah. He does not rebound from this band. Three Doors Down, Bon Jovi. So Silver Side Up was released as part of this kind of coordinated attack in 2001. And I won't go into how well exactly it did yet, but I do want to mention one quick fact here. It sold 
137,000 copies the first week. That's the week yep. of 9-11. That means that 177,000 people watched 9-11 happen on TV and then went out and bought this album. Talk about letting the terrorists win, man. I don't know if that's the case. Chad Lee, in an interview, he was discussing the process for their success, and he said that he studied everything sonically, everything lyrically, everything musically, and he would dissect every single song that he would hear on the radio, or every song that had ever done well on a chart, and he would say, why did this do well? He later said that his single, How You Remind Me, sold so well based on this formula. It's about romantic relationships, a universal subject, containing memorable hooks. I want to review what you just said, just ever so slightly. He attributes the success of This Is How You Remind Me by following the lessons learned, and the deep insight that drove the success of this song that only he would know because he spent <laughs> countless hours analyzing it. He came up with, it's about a romantic relationship, a universal subject, and contains memorable hooks. Yes. That's just describing a song. The fact that he had to make up a bunch of like Excel charts to get to that tells me this guy might not be human. Wait, what are we talking about here? Some <laughs> sort of bear? Some sort of lizard man? What do you think more, he is? More lizard man. I think the cold-blooded fits more into this. My point is that if you can't understand, oh, a universal subject, romantic relationships, these are things that people can relate to. If you have to like dissect it and make a formula for that, something's missing there. Oh, right. I misunderstood. I mean, he He's, he's probably a lizard person. Oh, if, maybe I didn't misunderstand. <laughs> if you tug on his face long enough, I suspect mm -hmm. there's some sort of horrible reptilian monster underneath. That's right. a given. But the I, other well, part of well, this... Well, I don't on, know if it's on, a Garrett, given. Garrett, okay, all right. Assuming that's true. This is 100% not art in any way. What this is, is a foreign person who has really done his homework. He has learned the mind of the average American. He's learned what's important to them. He's learned how they think. He's learned how to best strike to create the biggest potential impact. He has waited for the perfect occasion, the perfect day. He's got himself some collaborators, and then he has made his move. If only there was a musical version of Axl Rose that could be warning us about this. <laughs> So I feel like you might have started talking about something else at some point. So are you saying that he's not a human or he lacks humanity? It can be both. Have you seen him? He looks exactly like Dax Shepard. Oh, I Dax. wouldn't say that. He looks like somebody wearing a Dax Shepard mask that got drunk and it's a little twisted. 2002, as you mentioned, Chadley collaborates with a bunch of grunge and new metal musicians to produce the Spider-Man theme song Hero, mm -hmm. which I assume you also listened to recently for completeness? I did listen to it. It's not great. And then I watched Spider-Man. It's a good movie. It's a shame because they had to take out the World Trade Center net scene after this album came out. That's true. 2003, Nickelback hires one of their previous classmates, producer, and future Florida Georgia Line foister, Joey Moi, to make oh, The shit. Long Road. I didn't look too much into them after that. They or do, should you? They release an album every three years, all to kind of diminishing returns and i want to stress that kind of because they all still sell pretty goddamn well their 2017 album debuted at number five on the billboard 200 which is astounding that's crazy yeah i want to tell you a little bit about the man chadley himself in an huh? interview for playboy he was describing the year he was born 1974 and he said you know anything about zodiac signs <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio. A Scorpio is pretty much a walking penis. Getting that under control is difficult. Also, I was born in 1974, the year of the tiger, which means I'm a shrewd businessman and I pretty much want to take over the world. I'm a walking penis that wants to take over the world. So you can imagine. Imagine what? He's an idiot. I want to scream in the face of people that tell me things like that. I want to strike him. He would also list all their influences as CCR, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Metallica, U2, and Bob Marley. And I just want to say, all that adds up. A lot of it does. <laughs> Turns out that's not a great mix. All right, let's get into general thoughts. We've touched on it here and there. This is just plain bad music. Absolutely. The first thing I wrote down, worse than Creed. Ooh, yeah. I don't know if that's true. I think it is. I think this is worse than Creed. I had those two bands combined in my head. Best Crickleback? <laughs> Yeah, this is oral terrorism. Okay, you cannot keep accusing every album we do as oral terrorism. I think I, this granted, is the first time. Boy, I'm wrestling with the are they worse than Creed question. I'm not. I know, <laughs> I know you're not. 
I think you might be right for two reasons. Their songs are not songs. No. They are a verse and a bridge at best. And their singing is not singing. No. It is screaming. And he makes no apologies about it. The lyrics on this album are just so incredibly vague. I think it's an attempt to seem deep and meaningful, but they're so vague that they mean absolutely nothing. There seems to be a vagary sweet spot, because if you're too specific, then you and I can just, you know, we'll just literally talk about what you sang about. And then you kind of go down a bit, and it's... A little unclear there's some insinuations an implication or two and we kind of piece it together and then there's those situations where we have no idea what they're talking about and so we've got to kind of fill in the gaps with our own theories this sits at the bottom of this scale where it's so vague that I'm not always entirely sure what the general topic is. I find it difficult to pick out even individual lines that relate to what they claim these songs are about. I mean, maybe we're just real dumb and we don't get it. Nah. The lead singer of this band is definitely the guy that brings the guitar to the party. Um, And you know what? At first, when he's doing a cover of Enter Sandman and he's not actually singing along, great. But then as the night goes on, he's like, let me play one of my new ones wrote this about beyond and my future (laughs) did i mention i'm a virgo (laughs) the music on this is heavier than i was expecting their metallica cover band roots do seem kind of accurate oh sure there's more profanity and violence on here than i was expecting from my creed clone yeah but it really craps out halfway through the second half of this album has no thought put into it whatsoever yeah they should have named this album gasping for air they should have just made it an ep it's okay to just have six songs I don't have six songs. Well, no, we do have six songs. We have way more than six songs. We have but if, 30 songs. If all you have is six songs, you can release that. I have no doubt in my mind they only had six songs. This album's 40 minutes long with 10 songs. So yeah. I got to assume the first version of this was a tight 22. Yeah, they brought that to the record company and the record company says, I don't care what you do, make it 40. Then go scream for another 18 minutes. I, it doesn't matter. God, yeah. you are tough to look at. <laughs> Fix your face. Oh, it's so lumpy and weird. So let's let's talk about the music. It is music. Are they bad musicians? I don't think so. I don't think they're bad musicians, but I do think they're playing bad music. If you hire a bunch of session musicians, you can get the best guys in the world. But if you're telling them to play something that's garbage, they're not going to sound good. And I think that's sort of what's happened here. They're fine musicians, they just don't really have any good ideas. If you split these guys up and put them each in a different band that had good members around them, they'd probably rise to the occasion. Did I mention I hate this? You did, and I hate it too. It is easily hateable. It's not even fun. That might actually be, might summarize my general thoughts. It's not even fun. This is just bad. They're not giving us much to work with here. It's like the fray meets Britney Spears. You ready to get into these songs? I am. All right. This is going to be a weird one, I can tell. Song number one, Never Again. Whenever I found out this thing came out on 9-11 and that the first track is titled Never Again, just are you shitting me? I mean, they couldn't have known. They could have. The only way they could have known is if Axl Rose told them. There is another way they could have known. How? I mean, do you do want you, me wait, to say it? Don't say sympathizers right. or co-conspirators or... Muhammad Atta knew. Okay, Muhammad Atta knew. But Nickelback didn't. We don't know that. Jesus Christ, Garrett, we are starting out really rough this week. We start out with a song that is about domestic violence, sung by a child witnessing domestic violence. That is not what I thought we were signing up for. Oh, is it a child? I think I thought it was an ER doctor. The lyrics here are, he's drunk again, it's time to fight. She must have done something wrong tonight. The living room becomes a boxing ring. It's time to run when you see him clenching his hands. Later in the song, he mentions the mom yelling for him to go back to bed. This is oh, this yeah. is from the kid's point of view. I don't know if it's supposed to be autobiographical. I don't think so. I don't either. We should say up front, the podcast is obviously firmly in the don't strike a woman camp. I think we can both agree to that, right? Right. Okay. But we don't have to stand behind this awful song just because it is also in the Don't Strike a Woman camp, right? No. Okay, no. good. I called up Lean's Tuesday. Oh, we started listening to the album. And song number one, I was like, can I not listen to 
this and hate it? Do I need to support this because it is about serious issues that involve women? And she assured me, no. She also said, uh, God, what was it? I haven't forgotten about the butter. She said, you know what that means. I do know what that means. I will tell you off air. Please don't. No, Please I, do not. I'm going to. Don't worry. So this is sort of like the Patriot Act of songs. It's anti-domestic <laughs> violence. So you have to like it. If you don't like it, it kind of makes you seem like you're pro-domestic violence. And that is bullshit. I'm going to say it again. I am against domestic violence. And I am against this song. Absolutely. There's tons of songs like this. Basically every country song, or not every country song, but a lot of country songs have this sort of underlying theme uh yes, Tim, it's a universal theme that's what makes it so appealing <laughs> that's as a right song. but here's the problem those songs have a story they have progression they have characters they have nuance all things that this song completely and seemingly proudly just fucking lacks i listened to the album before i'd read the dossier and i was like oh this is some sort of like bush metallica metallabush bushalica Bushalica. You got it. Some sort of Bushalica. And that kind of doesn't ever stop. James Hetfield always kind of stayed in his range. He's not the best singer on the planet, but he knew his sweet spot. This whole album is if somebody was just like, just as loud as you can, James. <laughs> just scream. Just keep screaming. So this is the first song of several where he lets us know that he's going to kick somebody's ass. He, he looks like an ass kicker. Yes, he does. Well, he's a Scorpio, Tim. Well, yeah. Also, he was born in uh, in 1974. So, I mean, he's really, it's oh. just written all over him. He has no choice but to kick ass. In this song, it's father's a name you haven't earned yet. You're just a child with a temper. Haven't you heard don't hit a lady? Kicking your ass would be a pleasure. He definitely sees himself as kind of an action hero. See, I was going to say the opposite because he says kicking your ass would be a pleasure. I think that we are seeing the cries of an impotent child. At this point, sure. But whenever you get later into this album, he is... Oh, yes. So if that is the case, then this first track may be... Boy, Tim, we might have a universal theory of this album. <laughs> this is his origin this could... story? This is his origin story. I just, you know, I just love it when you get there on your own. <laughs> We're going to have to look at this now through the lens of, is this the classic hero's tale? It is not. But we is can look this at it through a that. crude ripoff of a Marvel movie? Could be. I think Marvel Probably. movie works better simply because he does seem to be copying some sort of Tony Stark facial hair at certain points of his career. Can we just outlaw goatees? Can we do that? It depends. Are you outlawing soul patches with it? Not universally. You have to apply for one. Okay. Uh, my name is Garrett Harvey. I running for senator, and I'm going to outlaw goatees. And regulate soul patches. Sure. Not guns, but soul oh, patches. Well, I want to get elected, Tim. <laughs> if you have a history of mental illness, you can still buy a gun, but you cannot have a soul patch. You can't be right. trusted. We've, you've got to keep the children safe. Right. Track number two, How You Remind Me. This has one of our favorite tropes on here, the how hard it is to be me, I try so hard and I give so much to this relationship, and it's just not appreciated. You know, I am, we, you may be even more than me, celebrate equal opportunity and equality among all gender, sexes, and creeds, right? Absolutely. However... What's interesting is, and it's undeniable, because we made these episodes. We've put our blood, sweat, and tears into these episodes. So there is one theme that I honestly would not have believed if I hadn't done the show. And how many of the albums we've done where the, the whole point, at least one song, if not multiple songs, looking at you, Ed Sheeran... <laughs> are about how great this guy is and how this woman just is the worst and how everything is their fault and not this guy's fault. It's just astounding. So the lyrics that we're talking about, it's not like you to say sorry. I was waiting on a different story. This time I'm mistaken for handing you a heart worth breaking. I do not understand the opening verse in this song. I'm so glad you said this because I I felt dumb. It was like trying to figure out a haiku. <laughs> you shouldn't have difficulty figuring out a haiku. Anyway, so yeah, the opening verse here. Never made it as a wise man. I couldn't cut it as a poor man stealing. Tired of living like a blind man. I'm sick of sight without a sense of feeling. I don't know what that means. I cannot help you. Yeah. I have poured over these lyrics. The, the very best I can offer you is that he has lived many... Uh-oh. 
Oh boy. So obviously, you know what I'm about to say. It's like he's lived multiple lives. Yeah, now, but everyone can't have done it. Have you lived multiple lives? Like, am I the only one missing out here? I've had many chapters in my book, but no, I would not say I've lived multiple lives. Okay. However, I don't think we're dealing with a Bon Jovi situation. I want to be clear. I don't think that this man has lived thousands of years end to end. I think one of two things is happening. And I shouldn't say this. This is a fresh theory. So it's it's definitely one of these two. Either he is living some sort of Groundhog Day scenario in which he lives his entire life, dies, and then lives it again. Arguably also a Quantum Leap scenario until he gets it right. Okay. Or he is reincarnated every time he dies and lives life again as a different person or potentially the same person, though I don't think so. (laughs) But he is aware that he has lived these multiple lives. Yes. And in the title, you have how you remind me. And he goes on to say, this is how you remind me of what I really am. Perhaps this is a song about him living these many lives. And he's met somebody that reminds him that he will never truly die. Notice he calls him of what I really am. He's obviously not a person. It's not a who. Well, no, he's he's got a lizard man underneath that skin. I am not ready to commit to that because I think we're dealing with a much larger nose situation. A much larger one. One that's kind of soft and malleable so you can shove it under a people mask. Okay, but you still think that there's there's something not human going on here. Well, you also can't rule out the idea that an even less conventionally shaped face human face is hiding beneath that human mask that's actually probably the most logical so like uh was it ed soltz what's our eric soltz what's his name eric stoltz eric stoltz yes but that you're talking about a completely different thing (laughs) i I mean he looks just like that guy i wasn't going to bring this up because it's a movie made in 1985 that is not worth your time but yes eric stoltz played the lead character of rocky dennis in the movie mask in 1985 and he looks exactly like Chadley Kruger. The genius annotation for couldn't cut it as a poor man stealing is simply neither could Aladdin. He made a much better prince with then a link to the YouTube video for the song One Jump Ahead. Gotta say much better song. Oh, I know that song. Yeah, you do. Everyone knows that song. It's not the best one on the soundtrack by any means. Well, of course not, Garrett. But you are you are a soundtrack snob. Well, a Disney soundtrack snob, I should say. <laughs> what a weird guy that would be. <laughs> what a weird guy that is. Now, I've only ever seen like three Disney movies in my life. <laughs> You've had such a sad life. Your father was a monster. He is a monster. Yeah, that's fair. So let's look at this through a different lens. Going back to our superhero analogy. We had his origin story, and now he's got a song, How You Remind Me. So perhaps he's lost his way. He has forgotten who he was as a child and how he was going to stand up for justice someday when he was large enough to fight back. A poignant moment has happened in his adult life, and he realizes something needs to change. All la Emilio Estevez when he gets his DUI at the start of Mighty Ducks. Yep, there's a DUI in that movie. Watch it again. This was also covered by Avril Lavigne, who, as we all know, he married. I assume she did that to humor him. Mock him. That could be. This was the most played song on the radio of 2002. It was also the fourth best-selling song for 2000 to 2009, and it was the best-selling rock song for the same period. That's depressing. So I wanted to ask you, Tim, do you know how you remind me of what I really am? I don't, but I'd love to know. I'm always... It's your overt physicality. Oh. Yeah, I am an angry man, and I do not want to be touched by you. Huh. You really put me in a place that reminds me of that. I suspect you like hugs more than you let on. I don't know how I could make it any clearer that I don't like them. I mean, that's what you say with your words, but it is not what you say with your body. Well, your body seems to be pushing me away as well as your words. Mm -hmm. But underneath the pushing, I feel a pull. You feel a pull under those arms? Under those shoving arms? That's right. I have tried to strike you. You have struck me. Yeah, it's true. But listen, Garrett. Yeah? I'm not going to let you push me away. Yeah, I noticed. Track number three, Woke Up This Morning. Is he rapping? A little, yeah. I thought we were going to get some full-on rap rock here. They walk the line between new metal and sort of kind of a grunge thing, like a shitty late 90s, early 2000s grunge, but post-grunge maybe? I don't know that we've really talked about the fact that, okay, we're dealing with a post-grunge band that started in 95, right? Yes. 
Is grunge dead in 95? I don't think so. You still have Pearl Jam doing some stuff. You've got Alice in Chains. Soundgarden is still... They had albums 94, 96. So what are they? Similar to your Creed, they're a band that wanted to be around in the early 90s. They had a grunge producer. They were in the grunge scene. Sort of. They're not grunge. I want to make clear. I'm not making an argument to call this band grunge. But they're not really post-grunge either. (sighs) Pre-post-grunge? Prost? I don't know. I think it's it's what it is. It's a mixture of grunge and sort of new metal influences. Yeah. My number one problem with this band is the singer. Yeah. You give me a good singer, I'm not going to like it, but it's way better. Better, I think. I think my number one problem with this is the lyrics and also the lack of lyrics. Back to Woke Up This Morning. Did you read what they described this song to be about? No, I'd love to know. Chadley wrote this song about his grandmother's funeral. He said, Oh my God, I I got it. (laughs) He said, and I quote, I was just really unimpressed with the way the whole funeral took place. I felt it could have been handled a lot better. I was in this really small town where she met my grandfather. After the funeral, he had to return to an unhealthy relationship. As far as I can tell, he wrote this song complaining that his grandmother's funeral wasn't that nice. Yeah, it wasn't fancy enough. First of all, I nailed it. I had heard some of this song before, and the only reason I know is because I once threw this album from a moving vehicle in November of 2001. I was in the front seat of a friend's car. Bear in mind, I'm a, I'm in, I'm a freshman in college. Yeah, right? so you're drinking real heavily. Whatever, Tim. I was feeling a little woozy. I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily thinking clearly. Not from the thing you said, of course, but so probably from... Go on. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> you Probably had taken from... your exactly $150 worth of mushrooms. Go on. <laughs> I am sure I was very tired from several long hours of hard study and abstinence. <laughs> and I was riding in the passenger seat, taking a couple of young ladies to a lovely dinner at Carrabba's. <laughs> Such a classy young man. Yeah. Were you um, wearing a button down tucked into Dockers? Probably not Dockers. I'm probably not tucked in, but definitely a button down shirt. Anyway. Well, you were too drunk to properly tuck in that shirt. Tired from long hours of study and abstinence. Are you saying anyway. study and abstinence or studying abstinence? And. Oh. How do you study abstinence? I, I mean, I'm sure there's some videos and some, some literature. Everything is a video as long as there's nobody fucking in it. <laughs> Everything's an abstinence video. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Anyway, so this song came on. First, we get in the car. We're driving to the restaurant. I'm not driving because I'm so tired from the studying and abstinence. And my friend's driving with the two ladies are in the back seat. And the previous song comes on. And I'm laughing because at the time it was quite normal for that song to be on 800 times a day. Then this song comes on and I realized... Oh, this is a CD we got here. (laughs) And so I just took it out of the CD player and dropped it out the window. I have also thrown CDs out the window to anger people. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Here's the difference. Later that evening, that same gentleman who was driving came up and was like, hey, hey, where's that CD you pretended to throw out the window? (laughs) Uh, That is gone. Given that this is about his grandmother's funeral, I don't know how the rest of this song plays into it. I've been a loser all my life. I'm not about to change. If you don't like it, there's the door. Nobody made me stay. There ain't a woman on the planet who can deal with it. Just how I wanted it. I'm hating all of this. Okay, you pieced it together. He's in a terrible relationship. He goes home from his Graham Graham's funeral, feeling like dog shit because there wasn't enough candles or fireworks. Can you have fireworks at a funeral? I have no idea. Oh, man. My funeral plans have changed. Garrett. You have funeral plans? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got a whole... Wait, wait. You shut up. You shut up. I need to know this and you be honest. I'm always honest with you and our audience. Oh, God. Troublingly so sometimes. Are the funeral plans that you have for you or for me? Oh, they're for me, but they include you. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, hold on. (laughs) Am I alive? Yes. Okay, that's good. Am I to be buried in some sort of mausoleum with you like a Smithers? Not exactly. Okay, go ahead. You are to be buried in a regular sized coffin with me. In the same regular sized coffin? Yes. That is terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) 
Think about this. Do you know how many fireworks are going to be packed in that coffin? I was going to ask you if the fireworks were in the coffin. I had a feeling that was going to be your instinct. And to answer your earlier question, no, you can't do that. So it's a saw-like test for you. Garrett, you're in that coffin. Do you have the courage, the fortitude to light those fireworks? Or are you just going to suffocate in that coffin with me? How is, how is that going to help? Oh, it'll end it quickly. My choices are suicide or die. I mean, either way, you've killed me. <laughs> That's horrible. What if, like, there will also be fireworks for the people, I it should probably say, for my mom, who will probably attend my funeral, to enjoy? Uh, so outside of the coffin as well? That's just to cover up all those coffin fireworks going off under the ground. Wow, Karen, we're not going to be under the ground yet. I assume you're going to light that thing up immediately. Right on the Why surface. Why don't I just open the coffin and leave? <laughs> I assume there's a padlock. I don't know. I did not include that in the living will because at the time I wrote it, I was not aware that fireworks were to be allowed. Is this but, why I had to sign all those documents? It, it'll all work out, I think, for the best. This is actually a good time to bring this up. People, make sure your affairs are in order. If you want fireworks at your funeral, write it the fuck down. Have that thing notarized. If you want somebody to be buried with you while screaming and still alive, write that down. Yeah, they're not going to throw them in the coffin after the fact if you don't have your paperwork in order. It sounds as though he's almost breaking up with a woman in the middle of this funeral. And I got so excited when I thought the song was about him breaking up with a woman. I couldn't have picked a funnier way to break up with someone by just repeatedly saying, I'm hating all of this, you need to leave. I would argue that the way you have broken up with girlfriends in the past has been, I mean, not for them, but funnier. Yes, that's true. (laughs) Those stories will not be told. I'll put them on Instagram. Don't do that either. (laughs) At least change my name. I assumed that all of the I'm hating all of this was just some fun meta commentary on this album or possibly song as a whole. Well, maybe this is one of the songs that they made him write after he turned in four songs and they said, no, we said album. Track number four, Too Bad. This starts off with this kind of Springsteen type thing. I called it post-grunge Michael Bolton. Sure, that works too. The difference between both of those things is it has no personality whatsoever. It's just, it's so very generic. The lyrics here are, Father's hands were lined with dirt from long days in the field, and mother's hands are serving meals in a cafe on Main Street, just trying to keep clothing on our backs. Universal themes. Um, The only way I can describe my reaction to this song is by using its own lyrics. And now I dream about it and how it's so bad. It's so bad. It's too bad. It's stupid. (laughs) Too late. So wrong. I feel like they're writing meta commentary to their own songs here. God, they really might be. What if they're self-hating Nickelbacks? This song is apparently about issues that Nickelback's Chadley Kruger faced after his father abandoned him whenever he was only two years old. So the lyrics, you left without saying goodbye. I'm sure you tried. You called the house from time to time to make sure you were alive, but you weren't there right whenever I needed you the most. But then that completely conflicts with the previous stanza with, uh, you know, father's hands were lined with dirt from long days in the field. Maybe it's a stepdad. Maybe. I mean, as far as I can tell, he just came from a single parent home for a time. And then he had that stepdad that was willing to the learn. charitable one that believed in him and his dreams. I don't really understand some other lyrics in the song. Just look at where we are. We made it out. We still got clothing on our backs. And now I scream about it. I understand that last line. He does scream about this. Everything. He yeah. screams about everything. <laughs> I got a really weird one for you. You're, if you didn't hear it, that's okay. Towards the end of the song, it sounds a great deal like simple man by leonard skinner huh on two different occasions i opened my notes to write that down and had already written it (laughs) on a separate note my memory is god awful (laughs) (laughs) that is accurate track number five just four Twelve distinct lines garrett 12 yes there are 12 lines there's 132 words total 69 of them are repeated 21 of those words are yes, I do. The song is over three minutes for 132 words. This is a song, well, A, it's a song about how he's kind of a badass, or at least wants to be. It's definitely on his superhero journey. Some lyrics here. I want to take his eyes out just for looking at you. Yes, I do. I want to take his hands off just for touching you. Yes, I do. And I want to rip his heart out just for hurting you. 
He definitely sees himself as some sort of superhero. Like, I think in the movie version of his life, he wants to be played by Denzel Washington. That's an interesting choice. Or possibly some sort of Keanu Reeves. Yeah, that too. I assume uh, we live in a post-racial world. I don't see why Nickelback's Chadley Kruger couldn't be played by a Denzel Washington, but sure. I, I, I was actually being more of an ageist than anything. He's an older man. <laughs> Fair enough. I said before that this album suffers from being too generic. Yes. In this song, he gets really detail-oriented, and that also doesn't come out well. Yeah, it's the opposite of subtext. He doesn't say he wants to kill this other fella. He doesn't say he wants to beat him up. He says he wants to take his eyes out. He wants to take his hands off. He wants to break his mind down. I think that maybe we had the origin story, and then his grandma dies. He's at his lowest low. He comes home, he has a fight with his girlfriend. And then you get to track five, and I think this is where he meets his nemesis. Now, in order to make the turn, Tim, you've got to have a nemesis. Sure. You've, you've always said that. You are the foremost authority that I personally know on nemeses. I ne- know nemeses. I have nemeses. I, I've, I did a doctoral dissertation on nemeses. Granted, I did not get my PhD that well, day. Well, you were trying to get it in biochemistry, so I, yeah, I don't was, know why you were talking about nemeses. It was roundly rejected. So now in Just Four, he's, he's met his arch enemy, his Harry Osborne, perhaps. He thought they could have been friends, but in reality, he's just trying to steal his girl. Yeah, that he doesn't like very much. Right. This is about the jealousy and the anger that's welling up. And, you know, he believes himself to have superpowers. I I assume it's possible that that this is the Spider-Man story, but he is the Norman Osborn. So he is seeing his Peter Parker with the Mary Jane and Mm. he is becoming jealous of that. And that's what's fueling his uh, evil, if you will. It's not bad. It's not bad. We don't know if it goes evil. He's taking people's eyes, Garrett. He wants to. Well. Because you want to take someone's eyes. As long as you don't do it, you can think those thoughts. Okay. So question for you. Yes. Have you ever thought about what Mm. you would do with my eyes once you have them? Yes. Okay. See, that's that's a problem for me. Why is that? I don't... I mean, you don't want me to take them and not have a purpose, right? Right. But that means you've gone a step further and take... So in your mind, you've already taken them. Now you need to figure out what to do with them. No, no. Quite the other way around, Tim. Okay. So you're making my point. You, like Chadley, are clearly the villain of your own story. Rude. Yeah. I am nothing like him. In your villainy only. Well, I don't don't have all day to, to argue my villainy, but I do have an interesting question. So this is a jealous character. Tim, do you consider yourself to be a jealous person? No. Would you be jealous if I had a podcast with a different co-host? Yes. I would take your eyes and your tongue. (laughs) Now, let me ask you a follow-up question, Garrett. Mm -hmm. Do you have a podcast with a different co-host? Well, I'm glad you asked. I am very pleased to announce my new podcast, Timothy Richardson is a Sucker. No, seriously. Can you believe this guy? What a sucker, or T R I A N S N S C Y B T G W A S. It's a podcast about books. <laughs> I'm going to take those eyes. Who's your co host? Slim Johnny. I'm going to take Slim Johnny's eyes, too. That is an irrational reaction. <laughs> that is an irrational uh, name. How do you figure? He's not slim, Garrett. This song was also featured on their 1996 album, Curb. So this is a situation where this song, this 12-line song, was so good that they included it twice. Uh, That just goes to support my theory that they didn't even have a full 40 minutes. And so they had to go back into the archives. Track number six, Hollywood. I was ready to enjoy this when the music began. It was like a not very good Queens of the Stone Age before the big guitars come in. Once it starts, it just gets kind of boring. Yeah. Is this song about a man who doesn't like waiting in lines? So I think so. The pre-chorus seems to be about how he doesn't like to wait in lines. Please um, don't be too long while you're gone. There ain't enough to keep me here too long. Not like the last time I stood in line. I think it's about standing in line at a methadone clinic. Boom! Nailed it! Apparently I am a nickel whisperer. (laughs) This is the second song in a row with only 12 distinct lines. Where are we at in this hero story? Again, he's not the hero. He is the villain. But I uh, disagree. (laughs) We'll see. I like this battle. Is he the villain? Is he the hero? Maybe this is a very deep album. That's that's really the the crux of all hero's stories and villain stories. Are they the hero or are they the villain? Saddam Hussein famously thought himself the hero of Iraq. All villains think they're doing the right thing 
Not all of them. Most of them. I know about the my funeral plans. I know that's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's funny. It is very funny. So you're saying this is the villain. And at this point in the song, he you're saying Harry Osborn has met Spider-Man. We're using this as a straw man, although it may literally be the story of Spider-Man. We're not sure. Harry Osborn has seen Spider-Man. And so he, he see, views him as his nemesis. Now he goes to do heroin. I don't remember that part. Yeah, he's upset mm-hmm. about this girl that maybe likes Spider-Man uh, more than him. And, you know, he wants to take Spidey's eyes, the Spidey eyes, but maybe get a little heroin before that to kind of work up the nerve. And then you start taking too much heroin because Wait, as we all know, there's no part delicious. of Spider-Man where the Green Goblin takes heroin. I guarantee you. I don't know this for a fact, but I guarantee you there is a storyline where a Harry Osborn, I guarantee you there's a heroine. Uh, well, I didn't plot. know we were talking about all Spider-Man. I was literally oh, talking, talking about the Garrett, 2001 Sam Raimi Garrett, movie. we are talking about the Spidey-verse here. Whole thing. All inclusive. All right. Whereas I'm going to say, fearing uh, his own powers and lo- possibly losing Mary Jane, Peter turns to a drug that makes him feel powerful. And that drug is venom. Boom. Nah. What do you mean, nah? I don't buy it. Okay, well, we're not done. (laughs) Not by a long shot. So we'll fucking see. Your Harry Osborn is doing heroin. My Spider-Man has at least just become the symbiote venom. Yeah. I'm sticking to the narrative. You're off doing H. (laughs) That's right. There's a part of this song that reminds me of Harry Nielsen's Lime in the Coconut. (laughs) I have no idea what you're talking about, but that is great. Do you know the song, though? Yeah, we absolutely. I'm not going to sing the similarities. Sing, at least sing the Lime the Harry the Nielsen song. Yeah. Now I feel put on the spot. Yeah. I'm putting you on the spot. Well, I am not abiding it. Garrett, sing a little of the song. I don't make me do this. Garrett, we both know that if you don't do it now, you're going to wait until I'm in the middle of a sentence and then you're just going to start <laughs> singing the goddamn song. So get it out now because I'm going to fucking take your eyes. Tim. Yep. You've got to stop threatening to take my eyes. Second. I would not do something so ridiculous and petty as to wait, lie in the weeds, get you on another topic, and then begin singing Harry Nielsen's Line in the Coconut. Okay, fair enough. So I guess you're not going to sing it. We should maybe move on, get to this next song. I hate you so much. I can only hope that your terrible, terrible memory fails you. Track number seven, Money Bot. Guess how many lines this song has? Is it more than twelve? It is exactly twelve. What in the world? <laughs> is this secretly this band's thing? I think that some record executive was just like, I don't care. Write more songs. What's a song? Twelve lines, a chorus, a couple of verses. Do it. All right, fuckface. I'm gonna go write twelve line songs, and half of them are gonna say I hate this. If that is the case, I like this band. Nah. Is this song about how money can in fact buy you happiness? I think so. I knew it. <laughs> That is definitely not a Spider-Man trait. That is a Harry Osborn trait. Well, right now he's Venom, so you don't really know. <laughs> he is not Venom. He is Venom. That's Absol- what the heroin represents. It's- no, the heroin represents heroin. Yeah, great fucking metaphor. What, what's the heroin stand for? Heroin. Look, it's not me. They're the ones that are not good at metaphors. Damn it, I can't really argue that. Well, Harry Osborn would definitely think money buys you everything. Yeah, that's my point. So he starts f- flourishing Mary Jane with gifts, thinking that money will bring her to him. Interesting, okay. And Peter, conversely, has begun dressing in all black, slicking his hair to the side, and punching women. Yeah. On Spider-Man 3. <laughs> Like we've discussed, the Why I Hate This Album podcast is against striking women. Of course we are. Spider-Man is not. When Spider-Man is Venom, specifically in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, he hits ladies. So He also brushes his hair like Hitler and does walking (laughs) montages to the Bee Gees. Is it possible that this album is about the tender dance between Spider-Man as Venom and his friend slash nemesis Harry Osborn? You think the entire album is about this? Yes. Where it goes back and forth and we're changing perspective? Yeah. Ooh, wow. That's giving them an awful lot of credit. I don't think so, because that's a terrible idea for an album. (laughs) (laughs) But it seems hard. I mean, a lot of people didn't love my musical, but it was a lot of work. No one did not love your musical. That thing was gold. And I have to say, I feel like I'm witnessing right now you creating the musical of this album in your mind, and it is inspiring. Thank you. Yes. It's going to do better than that goddamn Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark did. Well, it depends. Are you measuring success in injuries to actors? Yes. Oh, then it won't do as well. Well, no, no, no. The less injuries, the better. Like golf. Oh. You want a low score. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, you know what? I, that that one's on me. <laughs> the lines that we've been dancing around here. Look at what your money bought. It's all that she's got. It keeps her company straight from mom and daddy. Got that again. Different daddy this time. There's no confusion. She is not having sex with this daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's some more drug references in here. Hold on. I apologize. I I hate to interrupt you, but a classic Tim trope, and sometimes I leave it in and sometimes I take it out, is that Tim gets so angry at lyrics that he literally writes them down. And the comment that he wants to share with me is, these are so terrible. (laughs) For the first time ever, I was struck with the same feeling. Tim, you were about to read them, but I'm going to steal it because I literally wrote down lyrics just to say, (laughs) you gotta try harder. The lyrics are, she has a token, makes a joke about the alley man, never pleasured from the treasure in a garbage can. What are we talking about? She's making fun of homeless people and she's never had the joy of eating other people's refuse. Don't eat garbage, people. Make a living will. Don't eat garbage. That's our advice from this episode. That's our advice from every episode. If you make a living will, though, don't demand that one of your friends be trapped inside a coffin filled with highly explosive materials. Or do. Either way, it's your living will. That's what makes it your living will. Track number eight. Where do I hide? He said, she said, no, she don't. This song has 13 unique lines. They're so short. (laughs) I assume you read about what this song is allegedly about. Yes. Okay, so it's about Chad and a good friend who got in trouble when they were both really young. Chad got sent away for a little bit, and when he came back a few months later, he straightened up his act. But his other friend sure didn't. And one night, his friend came running into his house screaming, Where can I hide? His friend then dies in prison on his 18th birthday, injecting something into his arm that he thought was going to get him high. Maybe it did. Yeah. Third piece of advice. Always smoke your drugs. I was going to say know your limits. Nah. Don't skin Pop H. Well, no, you shouldn't do that. That will give you horrific infections that will lead to arms being amputated. Staff Arius is we? not to be trifled with, Garrett. You always trifle with Staff Arius. I am immune to staff. That is that is not true. Karen, look at your arms. Uh, well, that's different. <laughs> Those are horrible, horrible, multi-drug resistant staphylococcus lesions. Doesn't you are, bother me, bro. You are very sick. Doesn't bother me, bro. Garrett. Yes. That will kill you. If, if it doesn't bother me, I'm immune. No. And also that should bother you. It is hideous. Anyway. <laughs> right. Here's what confused me. The other thing I read is that it said that his friend used to run away a lot. It was unclear to me. Does he run away from like a shitty home and he's looking to hide at Chadley's house? Or is he running away from prison? (laughs) That's not how you phrase that, if that's the case. But this, I read this on Genius Lyrics, so I can't really trust grammar or English. It's the real Tim of websites. I assume you're most of the people on it. I am an administrator. So his friend may or may not have routinely escaped prison? Potentially. Canada is a much rougher place than I had originally assumed. I, I thought it was all Biebers and Simple Plans. No, there's some rough customers up there. Hmm. You know, we don't say tough customer to describe people very much anymore. I like it. No. So in Where Do I Hide? Obviously, there's one character who's trying to hide from the police or his parents. It's unclear. And another character giving him refuge. How is this Harry Osborn? How is it Spider-Man? Either Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, has broken free from the symbiote and is now on Eddie Brock, and he is seeking refuge because he doesn't have his spider suit at Harry Osborn's. Okay, so he's seeking refuge at Harry Osborn's. Yes. Okay, so then how is it not Harry Osborn? Okay, so obviously at this point, Spider-Man, aka Peter Parker, has now separated from the symbiote. He's no longer the black Spider-Man. And of course, his real rival down at the Bugle, Eddie Brock, is now wearing the suit, and he has become Venom. Mm -hmm. And so Spider-Man, he's being hunted by Venom, and so now he's trying to hide at Harry Osborn's. Exactly, yes. So Harry Osborn is the main character of this song. Spider-Man is coming and saying, where do I hide? And Harry Osborn is saying, hurry inside. God, your theory that it's about both of them might be true. Yeah. (laughs) Because they're intersecting at the end of the second act, just before the big battle scene. Wow. Just before the big battle scene of Hangnail, and before the closing credits of Good Times Gone. Jesus Christ, this thing's really coming (laughs) together. If it it's not about this it should be <laughs> 
This is more fun to do with a person than alone in a room with flashcards. Yeah. Your girlfriend. So she, you know, I don't ever, we don't discuss this. Your girlfriend occasionally emails me with concerns. There's a lot of concerns. I, I respect you enough that I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to embarrass you. Also, one time we discussed what to do whenever it's time to have you committed is the wrong word. The point is, at some point, you will need to be taken care of because of your debilitating brain thing. Uh, so we have also discussed that. But she did call me the simple plan week and express concern you were you were writing on the windows like some sort of beautiful mind thing except your what you were writing was anything but beautiful that, that all of that happened which I can't argue. However, I have to dispute the idea that you and my girlfriend exchange emails on my future palliative care. I can show you the emails. Please don't. Okay. That then literally crush me. <laughs> and this is why I never mention our secret discussions about what to do about your health and your future. Okay. I just, you know what? I love a good joke, Tim. I love a good joke. I'm not but joking. I, 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 we are I concerned. I, hey, I know. I know. Okay. Well, just please stop. <laughs> Track number nine, Hangnail. He at least admits it in this song. I don't sing too well. Don't sing too well. And so I settled a scream. I'm batting two for two. Now to go for the hat trick. What is this song about, Tim? I think it's about murdering somebody in a fugue state. Well, we're going to have to hash this out because that's not what I got. <laughs> oh, all right. What did you think? I think it is about a man leaving his girlfriend because she continually fakes her own suicide or hmm. threatens to. What's um, your evidence? I can't see the reason why, why there is blood on my sleeve. And all this time, I thought it mine, but it's not. It's yours. That's compelling. And it seems like the reason that he might be murdering somebody is because they're a thief or he believes them to be a thief. Later in the song, he says, next time you steal, better ask before you borrow. This label thief. Now, that's pretty good evidence that he may have killed somebody in a fugue state. This song is very, very hard to make any sort of Spider-Man analogies about. I think if you view it from a fugue state, and again, this is Harry Osborn. He's kind of crazy. He Half the time mm. he does doesn't know that he is the Green Goblin, sort of a different personality almost. If Spider-Man comes to him and Harry is turning to the Green Goblin to... Oh, turning into the Green exactly, Goblin. Exactly, yes. And so whenever he comes out of that, he is noticing blood on his sleeve and he he's looking around to see where he is bleeding before realizing that that is in fact someone else's blood. He has done battle mm. with both the Spider-Man and the Venom. You know what? I like this. I wish the battle was in the song. <laughs> well, Garrett, they don't have the budget for the battle in the song or possibly it's an artistic choice something like no country for old men where the ultimate showdown is off screen such a good movie that's interesting and i'm wondering did he battle spider-man did he battle venom Was he doesn't both? know he doesn't know and neither do we the listener intriguing i'd like to think that we don't see venom again and that this song is about him coming back to realize he's covered in blood and he's likely been battling spider-man i think this is a two-hander Oh, I don't yeah. want to get into that nasty territory of adding too many villains. That's what sunk Raimi. Yeah. So, you know, you do what you should have done with Venom is you tease him. So the he fought the symbiote, he ran from it, took refuge at Harry's. Little does he know Harry's going crazy. And then Brock stumbles on to the suit and he becomes Venom. But we don't see him till later when he becomes Tom Hardy. Yes. Anyway, boy, this song did have one line that hit me, Tim. It hit me hard and it shook me to the bone. What's that? They won't make no statues of you. It pains me to even think about, but I have to ask you this question. I need you to be honest. I need you to be friend honest. Okay. Have I missed my window? Is it possible, or should I say, is it no longer likely that at some point civilization will build a statue in my honor? You know, I... Ooh, I don't like the start of this. I, I don't know. I cannot answer that we agree that when you knew me at, say, 25 or even 23, there was no doubt, just with you as it was with me, that certainly at some point, a civilization, if not our civilization, was going to build a statue in my honor, right? Oh, I'm absolutely. Crazy. It was okay. certain. I mean, okay. the time that Ted Cruz beat you in that senatorial race, that really decreased your chances. Yeah, that one hurt. And I was such a goddamn gentleman about it, too. You were. He was kind of a dick. Garrett, I can tell you this. If you have happen to die before me and i don't get to do that coffin thing i will 
build a statue in your honor. However, the inscription on the statue may be uh, unpleasant for you. I haven't I haven't completely figured it out yet, but it might be some poetry from your notebook so that you are forever oh, remembered. On. It's the statue of me like holding the notebook and I fucking uh, a girl in the front row. Yes. She will also be part of the statue. So it's it's me at 16. Maybe. I've worked up her part of the statue. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't drawn up all the plans for your side, so it could go either way. It's it could look be 10 times worse if it's a 30-year-old <laughs> me staring at a 16-year-old girl. What if it's a 16-year-old you, but it has 30-year-old you's beard? Or is That's... the beard the only thing that makes you 30-year-old? Also, you are not 30 years old. I don't know where we're getting this piece of information. <laughs> that is inaccurate. The you are at least only... a decade away from being 30. I hate you. That is not true. Is there anything else to say about this stupid song other than the Spider-Man stuff we got out? (laughs) No. Great. Track number 10, Good Times Gone. This is such a weird addition to this album. I thought it might be a cover. It's this attempt at Americana that feels very out of place on this album. It's tough. At the opening, we get some excellent pedal steel. There's a bluesy slide guitar played throughout this thing that sure, I genuinely enjoy. Starting small. I agree. The slide guitar through 99% of it, awesome. Boy, Tim, how does this baby hit you with such a unique cowboy country flair? I know you've mentioned once or twice that you dabble in the cowboy world. So did, did this do anything for you? There's certainly aspects of it. So you've got Chesterfield. I don't know if that's a cigarette or a couch. They're from it's Canada. A couch. Okay. There's a gambling wheel, diamond mine, good Good times, cornfields, tractors, the devil, God, the silver screen, preachers. Like, it's got a lot of Americana things, but I don't necessarily know that it is cowboy-centric. I'd call a gambling wheel sort of cowboy-centric. What is that, I think, though? Is that, a, is that a roulette wheel? It is to me. Okay. Cornfield, tractor wheel, less diamond mind. But folks, in case you don't know, the things that, that we are listing right now, they are places where this gentleman has potentially lost his good times. Whenever he said the Chesterfield, I immediately assumed he was talking about losing his virginity, as virginities can be lost on couches. That happens from time to time, but not in diamond mines. I mean, that, that's a real tragic story. If you're losing your virginity in a diamond mine, it probably isn't voluntary. I think, though, that this really brings home your, and now ours, I'm claiming partial ownership, the Spider-Man Harry Osborn. The okay, last, bring it home. The last verse, he says he saw it on the silver screen, last page ad in a comic book. He's teasing the fact that that's what this entire album has been about. I think they had a battle and Spider-Man walked away, but just barely. You know, Harry comes back, realizes he's covered in blood, but the good times are over. In the sequel, it's no holds barred. Perhaps Spider-Man, Peter Parker, and Harry Osborn have found a way to settle their differences on a Chesterfield. What do you mean? Just sat down and hashed it out. What do you think I mean? Oh, no. Never mind. Well, with your earlier, yeah, that's not important. <laughs> this should be a Blake Shelton song. It does fit a country aesthetic. But again, yeah, maybe I'm just even, I'm not seeing cowboys in it. Boy, maybe it's more of a Garth Gaines or Chris Gaines, his nephew. That guy was losing stuff in diamond mines all over the place. Well, he, he was finding stuff, too. Yeah, I mean, he played both parts. I think it's it's a cycle, Garrett. Well, after you've lost it in a diamond mine, your natural inclination after you acquire power is to take it from somebody else in a diamond mine. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow, that is upsetting. <laughs> so, Tim, I had a revelation with this song. Quite the revelation. This song, and perhaps this band, is the opposite of Florida Georgia Line. The exact opposite, in fact. Florida Georgia Line sang about the good times. Hmm. This song and this band sings about the bad times. Specifically, with Florida Georgia Line, you get This Is For The Good Times. With Nickelback, you get Where The Good Times Gone. Where The Good Times Gone. All the stupid fun and all the shit we've done. Where The Good Times Gone. That made me wonder. We have Texas Toast, right? Wildly successful, analogous band to, say, your Florida Georgia line. So perhaps it makes sense, seeing as how Nickelback has done so well for themselves, if we also create a post-grunge Nickelback-esque band. And of course, after I wrote the first six songs, I then thought, well, we got to have a good name. So, as usual... I have made up a list of names for our band. This is a post-grunge band, Tim. This is supposed to be the opposite of Texas Toast. You ready for these names? Absolutely. Soap Bucket. Okay. Nine Days Late. 
landing gear. Okay. Yeah. Doctrine. See, that has too much mm. of a creed feel to it. I don't like that. I don't like creed. <laughs> <laughs> the creed made all the money tim yeah. you don't like florida georgia line either no okay articles of impeachment Ooh, that one's fun and timely wake up karen i really like wake up karen pet resurrection living puppets Ooh, i don't like that that has too much of an ed sheeran vibe <laughs> it's what pinocchio would have looked like if he'd become a real boy <laughs> Hazel's Ashes. That one's a little dark, but all right. Sewer Kings. Ooh. And Hoobastank. <laughs> <laughs> I have some bad news for you on the last one, Garrett. Somebody, somewhere, has trademarked the word Hoobastank. That's impossible. That's that's a noise I made while sneezing. Yes, it is. All right, so let's narrow it down. So Soap Bucket, Nine Days Late, Wake Up Karen, Articles of Impeachment. That seems that could more be a like, good album. Yeah, it also sounds more like just a regular punk band. It's also probably been used. We know no band has ever been called Wake Up Karen. <laughs> I like the idea of the band being named Soap Bucket and the first album being Wake Up Karen. With our single, Articles of Impeachment. You put the lime in the coconut, <laughs> oh, drink it. it all oh. up, you put the lime mm. in the coconut, and mix it all together. God, dude, you waited just until I forgot. The band is Soap Bucket. The first album is Wake Up Karen. Look for our new single, Articles of Impeachment, on the radio soon. I wonder if we could do maybe the soundtrack for the new Spider-Man. Probably like, not. If you said the same thing when I said, I wonder if we could start a podcast. Yeah, and I, I stand by it. Probably not. We did. Right, but we probably couldn't. Well, that's true. We should at least try. We should. What we should do is write a bunch of songs about Spider-Man to back up the articles mm -hmm. of impeachment. And right. that way, they're more likely, because they'll be like, dude, we, we, these songs are already about Spider-Man. Yeah. Technically, Nickelback beat us to it. But only you and I know that. We should not air this episode. We should do that other thing where we make money. <laughs> that brings us to the end of the song by song, which means it is time to talk performance. Tim, how much money did this thing make? Oh, this did really, really well. It only hit number two on the Billboard 200, but it was a number one album in the UK, Austria, Ireland, and Canada. Holland, of course, fares a bit better as it only hit number 15 on the Dutch mega charts. The places that were listed with number of copies on this might be the longest I've ever seen this thing sold 90,000 copies in Macau how it was certified sextuple platinum in the u.s and has sold over 10 million copies worldwide here's the thing though it sold 8 million copies worldwide by 2002 so Whoa. this thing just flew off the shelf they have sold as a band more than 50 million albums worldwide they were the 11th best-selling musical act in the 2000s and billboard has ranked them as the most successful rock group of that decade robert christgau didn't review this and good for you mr christ go amazon has 404 reviews 4.2 at a five star average 66 percent four to five stars and 15 percent one stars many many people just had reviews about how they bought a second copy after it was stolen or they wore it out so the sales numbers might be slightly inflated and something like a quarter of the reviews on amazon mentioned that chadley or chadwick or chaddington looks like jesus he looks like like Jesus. Yeah. So first review here, Nickelback takes things to a new level. This was written in 2012. It is as if Nickelback's eccentric frontman, Chad Kruger, has swallowed John Lennon, Robert Plant, and Jim Morrison and channels their spirits into one magnificent vocal sound that is incomparable in today's musical landscape. Maybe not since Creed's Weathered has an album been so grandiose, so introspective, so magically mind-compelling that you literally feel each individual goosebump rise off your tattered and shredded skin that has been caused by the intense and Hendrix-like guitar riffs. The drums and bass seem to almost dance with one another, but unlike Cinderella, these guys won't be arriving in a pumpkin-shaped wagon or wear glass slippers. Think rocket ships bound for the outer reaches of the solar system in a pair of 1960s Vietnam-style marching boots. That's how it ends? It's so abrupt. I was just getting into it. That was written by Chad Kruger. <laughs> Hold on a minute. What's weirdest and most unsettling to me is that rather than just say he is channeling the spirits of and then listing Jim Morrison, John <laughs> Lennon, and, and Elton John, maybe? Robert Plant. 
is that he begins with saying that he ate them. <laughs> That's, maybe he knows something we don't. If this is Chadley writing this, perhaps he is he is leaving a national treasure-like clue to exactly how to also achieve that face situation. Or possibly how to achieve either reliving the same life over and over again, or potentially being reincarnated after you die. You must eat the soul of somebody else. Or their body. Nope, nope. This is not a pro cannibalism song, Tim, and I'm not going to hear it. <laughs> this is not a pro cannibalism podcast either. No, it's not. This is from 2002. It's called The Future Is Now by The Peace Dog. Where I come from, this is considered true rock music. Nickelback is whack. Chad Kruger has a kind of gritty voice that will leave you hanging on his every syllable. In fact, his ballad hero from the excellent Spider-Man CD is proof of that. He is kind of a mixture of Eddie Vedder and Chris Cornell, though he possesses much more talent than those two washed-out has-beens ever did. The future of rock is Nickelback. Peace out. (laughs) Wrong side of history, friend. What else you got? This is by Jay Sherman, and it's from 2010. It's entitled The Highlight of a Horrible Day. (laughs) This album came out on 9-11-2001, the day of the World Trade Center disaster. I remember purchasing this on a midnight release that day. I listened to this a lot that day, and it was probably the only good thing about that day. This is, in my opinion, the best album Nickelback ever released by far. It had some radio-friendly songs on it, yet it had teeth, unlike the generic mush this band releases now nine, nine years later. He wrote this review nine years later? Yes, remembering the events of September 11th through the lens of Nickelback. I told you they are inextricably linked. You can't have Nickelback without 9-11, and you can't have 9-11 without Nickelback. I don't know if that's true. It is. So you're saying Nickelback caused 9-11? No, 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 no. It's like the butterfly effect. They're they're just inextricably linked by happenstance, by fate. I don't know. I am not a philosopher. I don't know that much about astrology. I don't know that much about what happens if you're born in 1974. The point is that I do know something about those two events, this album and 9-11, have been joined. Where does Ashton Kutcher come in? I don't think he's involved. Great. Great reviews. <laughs> Who is this for? I can think of exactly 19 people that I hope are listening to this on repeat in hell right now. Are these your nemeses, I guess? No, uh, 9-11 hijackers. Who is this for, Garrett? It is for people that were 17 the year it came out, who now have a goatee, put way too much gel in their hair, and enjoy wearing work shoes with white socks. I find everything you're saying to be insulting. I no longer (laughs) listen to, like, tolerate Nickelback. It's unclear if I ever did, but I certainly don't now. I think I remember at the start of the episode you were saying how much you liked Nickelback. I don't think that's what I said. I think you're reading into this, and unfortunately you're reading into this and saying I like Nickelback instead of me being some sort of Spider-Man character. You're never going to be Spider-Man. Green Goblin? You got a better shot at it. You know what? It's unfair to me to say you can't be Spider-Man. I got a jar of spiders here. Okay. When we're done uh... here, we'll have you stick your hands in there. Any final thoughts that you got to get out about this album that we haven't already said? Usually we say we'll never listen to this again. At least I say I'll never listen to this again. This week is a little different. We will listen to this once every year. This will be oh, no. <laughs> this will be part of our solemn 911 tradition. Never forget Garrett, never again. Garrett, do you hate this album? Yes. <laughs> I hate it so much. It's so unimpressive in so many ways. Yeah. And none of them funny. Tim, I love Spider-Man. Love him. Lots of fun. Not my favorite. For God's sake, my dog's name is Batman. However, even Spider-Man made it super hard to enjoy this. Tim, answer me this. Do you hate it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Fuck this. Oh, it really came around, huh? No, (laughs) it didn't. (laughs) Yeah, it is fair to say we did not, in fact, get there. We were there. We've been here the whole time. All right, I think that just about does it. I do want to make just a second announcement. Please do tune in to my new podcast. Tim will not be in any way a part of it. Uh, you can find it. It's under uh, Timothy Richardson is a sucker. No, seriously. Can you believe this guy? What a sucker. Or if you don't want to type all that out, I totally understand. Just uh, simply T R I A S N S C Y B T. 
tgwas.net. It's a classic literature podcast. Me and my co-host Slim Johnny pick a book every week. As always, for this show, you can find us at hatepod.com. Find us on Instagram at hatepod. Find us on Twitter at albumhatepod. Or you can email us directly at hatepodmail at gmail.com. Or on the website, you can click on the contacts link and you can just email us from there. Either way, it's going to get there and we're going to answer you. If you don't want to do the email thing, you hate social media but you're still on facebook for some reason we're at facebook.com slash hate pod oh yeah while you're at all these places rate review subscribe tell your friends tell your grandma tell your dog rate review subscribe we really do appreciate it we actually do respond to all of them write us an email write us a note we will get back to you we won't leave you alone tim did i leave anything out no great this has been why i hate this album i am one of your hosts garrett harvey i'm the other tim richardson the riffs are too repetitive the lyrics make no sense all the songs are b-sides and the cover art's a mess there's so much here to tear apart listen to it for a week now that we pass past why i hate this album podcast with tim and garrett